Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Lupus LA podcast, Your Story, Our Fight. Uh, as always, I want to thank our sponsors, Malincrat Pharmaceuticals, uh, Emerge Business Management, and the good folks at Gemini Beauty. Um, today, we are intro- interviewing someone very special to me, uh, Lauren Schuler Donner. Uh, Lauren, you are one of my, my favorite people, one of my biggest mentors, and um, I'm so happy you're on. Now, for those um, who are new to Lauren, you are not new to her work. Um, Lauren has produced some of the most iconic and amazing movies of our of our lifetime, Pretty in Pink, Free Willy, St. Elmo's Fire, uh, Dave, one of my absolute favorites, Secret Life of Bees, and and probably what you're most known for is producing nine of the X-Men movies. So mega franchise producer and all while having lupus. And that's what we're going to talk to you about today is is your journey and and how you've managed to become, you know, such a mega success uh, all while uh, having some, you know, significant health challenges. So uh, welcome to the show, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I know, you know, we've talked before, obviously, and I know you, you had some illness as a child that eventually led to your lupus diagnosis. Can you tell me a little bit about kind of growing up and and how you started to to manifest your symptoms? Uh, yes, actually, I had a fluke. It was um, I was in and out of the hospitals from ages of nine to twelve. What happened was, I, I at nine years old, I uh, went to the bathroom orange. It was unusual. I was uh, too young uh, to you know be menstruating or anything like that. My mother took me to the doctors. And what happened was that they did some uh, x-rays and MRIs, and they saw that, ironically, my kidneys were all chewed up on the outside. So they freaked out, and they thought there was major kidney damage. And they were trying to figure out what it was. Um, And so the years between 9 and 12, I was in and out with infections, and they were trying to to subdue them and, and cure them and find out what was causing them. It turns out that indeed the outside of the kidneys are all chewed up, but it has nothing to do with the function. My kidney function is 100%. By the time I was 12, they figured out how to get rid of the infections and I've been fine ever since. Um, but it was, it was, it was just a freak. I mean, because going, whatever, it was a broken blood vessel, which made me go to the bathroom in odd color. And, but it was, had they not, found that had they not dealt with it, I probably wouldn't be here today. Um, But I'll tell you in terms of lupus, because I was thinking about this today. um, First of all, I do believe because between the ages of nine and 12, until you're 12, you're in a ward with other children in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so I experienced my hospital uh, visits with other kids and, um, I'm pretty social, so I got to know, always got to know <laughs> people on the beds near me. And you, as a kid, you're resilient. You don't realize that it's a big deal. Of course you do. You're out of school. You're not seeing your friends. You're in a hospital. They're taking your blood. Things hurt. But you don't realize that it's a really big deal as a kid to be in a hospital. You just mm-hmm. get through it. Right. And um, so I, I think in a sense it – prepared me for having lupus later in life. I I do remember at one point, um, my one of my folks saying to me that I would ha- be on medicine for the rest of my life. And I remember a voice in my head saying, oh, no, I won't. And it was just <laughs> that voice that has sort of kept me going through my life because I've had a lot of illness. And... Um, I, and I'm sure that it's that it steeled me for having more illnesses and and you know seeing that it's all part of life and that you'll get over it and you'll be able to move forward. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, I totally agree it. with you because yeah. right, exactly. No, I, I mean, I <laughs> totally agree with you because I was 16 when I was diagnosed and there was no internet and I you know you just don't know how big of a deal it is. I you know I feel that people getting diagnosed today have a real tougher time with that because these kids are so connected. And they're getting so much information so quickly. And I think for you and for me, it it sort of shaped you. You were allowed to shape your position about being sick 
in a way that you can't necessarily do that today. And yeah. um, so I, do, I, I totally, I totally see where you're coming from. So then, so then after you're, you're 12, then when were you diagnosed with lupus? Well, I, I, I've, I got lupus in my late twenties because I got okay. symptoms, but I wasn't diagnosed until I was 33. Um, because of the kidney infections, because I kept going to my doctor and my doctor who was an internist, but his specialty was nephritis. So mm -hmm. he kept looking for kidney things. They reimplanted my ureters and my bladder. They, I had kidney stones, which had never bothered me, never mm -hmm. grew. They blasted those. They did everything, but they were on the wrong track. They never looked for lupus. And this is, you know, years and years ago, this was in the sure. late seventies and early eighties. Um, and they didn't, nobody looked for lupus at that time. Uh, mm -hmm. finally, what happened was a friend of mine who ran a studio, um, I ran into her, or actually I was working there and she said, she looked amazing and she seemed so healthy. And I asked her why. And she said she was going to, uh, Saram Khalsa, who is a Sikh doctor, a medical right. doctor who's a Sikh. So I thought, well, I'm going to go see him. And he was he who did a test. And, and he said, you know, your AMA count is high. I think you have lupus and I'm going to send you to this doctor. And he sent me to Dan Wallace. Somewhere along the line, though, I did go to Dr. Hahn, Bever Hahn at UCLA, mm -hmm. who um, I think maybe I went to her first. She was very discouraging. She said, you'll hurt all your life. There's nothing I can do. Basically, it was like, oh, my God. Then I went to Dan, unfortunately. And Dr. Wallace was like, well, we're going to do this. If that doesn't work, we'll do that. And if that doesn't work, we'll do this. And anyway, so I was not diagnosed until I was 33 years old, which was so early. So take me back to the start of your career. Um, and at that point, did you have any symptoms when you were first getting into the movie business or did they come later on? No, I had them. I, um, so I, I, um, I, I worked my way up and I actually produced my first movie for television. I was an associate producer on Thank God It's Friday. I was like 26 hmm. and I produced my first movie for television um, when I was 27, I turned 28 on that movie. Um, I then developed, um, I then moved into features and, uh, Lady Hawk was my first, actually, Mr. Mom was my first movie. Mr. Mom. One of the best. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, John Hughes. Uh, but that, it took a while and, the whole time, I, part of my symptoms was that I had a low grade fever. So I would walk around with like 99.9 .9 degree fever, which makes mm -hmm. you just feel awful. So I was taking a, a ton of Excedrin, mm -hmm. um, which by the time I started prepping Lady Hawk in the 81, um, I was, I had, by the time I was 83, I developed a really great ulcer because I was mm -hmm. taking all that right. Excedrin. A lot of um, but I, I was able to, I didn't know what was wrong with me. And so I would suppress it. I would suppress it, but it, it was, it was difficult. Obviously there was something wrong. And it, once I found out what it was, and once I started to get treatment, my life was a lot better. It was a lot easier. Yeah. Did, do you think that you're, I mean, you're one of the most determined people I know, you know, when you set out to do something, that's it. It's going to get done and it's going to get done efficiently and fast and, and you move very quickly and which I always think is super inspirational. Do you think that exacerbated your early symptoms? Like your, do you think your drive and your determination, um, you know, caused the stress to kind of soup everything up or do you think it was the other way around? Oh, um, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. I think that it made it harder for me mm -hmm. um, in what I was doing was already hard because there were not many women producing and I had other factors to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, what I, what I learned, you know, it's interesting. I just thought of this. What I learned because I was a camera woman before I transitioned over and I became a social producer in television, then an associate producer in features. And then I produced a movie for TV. 
But when I was a camera woman, um, it, it, that was really, really hard. The older cameramen did not want me and they mm-hmm. made it very clear. And it was really hard. The young guys were great, but the older guys were not. Um, and it sort of, you know, it hurt very much. Uh, I never let it show. I did everything. But what I finally got to a point where I thought, that's your problem. It's not my problem. You have a problem mm-hmm. with me. It's your problem. And once I, I felt that philosophy and I believed it and I acted upon it, it made my job easier so that, um, I, I was sort of able to compartmentalize. I have this thing, but it's not going to stop me. Nothing's going to stop me. I don't know Mm -hmm. why, I don't know where my drive comes from. I'm sure some of it was from being ill, but, um, I, I, I get to a point where I talk to myself and I just say, that is not going to just flip it around, change the philosophy, move forward. And, and I was able to do it. Well, and, and camera operating is no, I mean, that's a physical job and that's a very, that's a grueling job. And I made sure I carried all, that's a, the, one of the reasons I left. I made sure I carried all my own equipment. I never wanted anybody to say, well, woman can't, you know, handle the job. And my, one of my last jobs was um, uh, shooting Easter sunrise services at Hollywood Bowl. And I was the top camera. So oh, I took all the equipment up there and on the way down, I thought to myself, you know, I think I'd rather tell people how, what to shoot. <laughs> I had had, I mean, that was it. I, I proved myself. I did it. It was great, but I was open. Yeah. Fantastic. You know, it's, I mean, that is, I, you, you watch as a producer, brutal. you watch it's, it's brutal. And the yeah, hours are, are really crazy too. Um, and so, okay. So you get into, you get your lupus diagnosis and at what point now are you, you're, you're sort of really in the middle of your career in the, in the heat of your, your growth of your career. What does that do to you um, mentally when you act? Okay. Now they've told you, you have lupus and here's all of the potential ramifications of lupus. How do you then adjust sort of your, um, your vision for your future? You know, I, I just, I believed in Dr. Wallace. I really, really believed in him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I believed he was giving me medicine and, and he was helping me. Um, I had an amazing physical therapist who was working with, because my, my neck and my, my shoulders would freeze, literally get paralyzed. Uh, and they gave me antidepressants and, um, to deal with the stress so that the stress wouldn't exacerbate the lupus. Uh, and those were, enormously helpful to me because of my chemistry and my whole family's chemistry, actually. Mm-hmm. So I I had uh, three components working in my favor. And I think that's what helped me uh, carry on. Mm-hmm. And so what was sort of the movie you were working on at that period? Where, where did that, where, where did that fall I mean, in your no. career? Lady Hawk took years to make. So it, there uh-huh. was Lady Hawk, there was Mr. Mom, Mr. Mom first. Uh, and then, uh, and then Lady Hawk and it also damaged my first marriage, but that, that was not meant to be anyway, but it, but it certainly had an impact on it because I had emotional swings and the Mm -hmm. lupus, you know, when you don't feel well, you're, you're at your worst and, um, or I am, um, uh, and, um, uh, but it, but, um, in, in doing Lady Hawk, uh, when I came back, that was when I saw Dr. Wallace and that was when I found out what it was. And that was when the, um, you know, when his cure started, I I got on a lot of medicine and, um, and, and so it was Lady Hawk. Uh, but then because, you know, then because of my relationships, because, uh, the movie I had produced for television was Joel Schumacher wrote and directed it. And then, he wrote St. Almost Fire and he came to me and said, would you produce St. Almost Fire? So I just moved forward. And then John Hughes came to me and said, I have Pretty in Pink. I have a new director. Will you produce Pretty in Pink? So I didn't even, it never occurred to me not to work because I was sick. It right. never you just went, you just went from one to the other. Yeah. 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 I was so glad, thrilled to be working with my friends again. So we're going to take a quick break. And then I want to talk to you about how you manage the actual day to day especially when you're working um, and, and about 
what you recommend for for others with lupus. But we're going to take a quick break and uh, do some advertising and tell some tell some lupus facts, and we'll be right back. Lupus LA's fellowship program is an essential part of ensuring the training of future rheumatologists. The nation is experiencing a serious shortage of pediatric rheumatologists. Today, there are approximately 300,000 children diagnosed with rheumatic conditions in the United States, but only about 250 practicing pediatric rheumatologists to meet this tremendous need. Call 310-657-5667 or visit our website at lupusla.org to support the efforts of Lupus LA. And we're back on the Lupus LA Your Story, Our Fight podcast, talking to Lauren Schuler donner uh, And before the break, we were talking about your career, but I, I want to get specific in terms of, you know, for those that, that aren't in the movie industry, the, the time involved in making a feature film uh, is enormous. And the hours are brutal and the schedule is, you know, is is insane and especially with movies like x-men where you're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of people working on these movies so tell me you know what's it what's a day like for you and how what are the what are the tips and tricks you use for sort of getting through that kind of a schedule you know I, some of it is just <laughs> a business sense it's just being prepared you know i mean mm-hmm. just and and also making a movie, there's there's different phases of it. So so you know there's development of the script, and then obviously selling it to the studio. But there's preparing, and then there's filming, and then there's post. And it's the filming that is so brutal. Um, mm-hmm. uh, at that, you know, um, I would just let my passion for the project guide me. Uh, my tips, you know, my tips come more from having cancer really than having lupus because I was just sort of dumb and blind when I had lupus because I had in my twenties and in my thirties, um, and, and forties, I, I, I just marched forward. I just thought that you just go forward. And if you don't feel well, you just go forward and you take a, you take a Tylenol or you, you move mm-hmm. forward, you move forward, you move forward, or you see your doctor and you do what the doctor tells you. And, um, I, when I got cancer though, and I got cancer when I was 50 and chemotherapy really fell to me and, and radiation, I learned about napping and napping and meditation. And those two tricks, um, are, are extremely valuable. Meditation mm-hmm. is, it, you know, it, is worthwhile. It rejuvenates, it stills the mind, allows the mind to just shut up and, 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 um, collect itself and get its power and napping um, uh, with chemotherapy. You're, you have a, a, a gas tank and, and right. you use half the fuel, you use half the fuel. You, it's unlike with lupus, I could continue to power through. And part of that was the prednisone too, I will say. Mm-hmm. Part of that was steroids. It allowed me the energy that I didn't have in my body. Um, yeah. But napping, there are a lot of directors I work with who during lunchtime will take a nap. And, and mm-hmm. that's how they rejuvenate themselves for the second half of the day or evening when you're shooting. Um, and those are two really, really valuable tricks. Um, yeah. That, and, you know, steroids, I'm sure are controversial. I mean, I, uh, occasionally I still take them now. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. sure that they've weakened my bones. On the other hand, I could not have gotten through. I could never have produced all those movies were it not for those prednisone drips. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I'm the same way I'm on prednisone every day. I take a little bit because my body now doesn't make its own cortisone. So I take six milligrams of prednisone every day. And if things go haywire, that's the first, the first, the first stop on my, on my train. But I think, you know, I think what I always find interesting too is, and I think cancer and, and lupus and, you know, dealing with these longer term, battles, it really does, it, you know, there's something that, there's something that, that I think in your brain has to click one way or the other, and you have to make a decision and you have to say, okay, I'm not going to let lupus win. I'm not going to let cancer win. And I, I find that, 
you know, I think some people have that come easier than others. And I think um, some people have to dig deep to find it. But I do think you're right. I, I think meditation and a lot of what we've been talking about lately at Lupus LA is alternative therapies and things that are complementary therapies and yes. and whole health. And, and I think that's a really important part of everybody's journey or it should be at this stage with what yes. we know. Um, yes. And I so tell me, yeah, go ahead. No, I was saying it is very, it is very important. I think, you know, I, I, I think determination is very important. And you, even if you don't feel it, you can fake it till you make it. I happen to have been, um, as a, as a teenager and child, but mostly as a teenager, very rebellious. I, um, and I don't know why. I don't know why, but I, I, I just felt certain rules <laughs> didn't apply to me and, and I broke rules and I just live, you know, and if I got in trouble, I got in trouble. But then, you know, I, that's just how I have always been. I don't like authority. That's why I'm an independent <laughs> producer. Um, and, um, I think it has done me well. I think it has helped me because I can say, this is not going to stop me. You are not going to stop me. This rule is not going to stop me. Lupus is not going to stop me. I don't know where it comes from. I was born with it. Um, and, but I also am, uh, shy and introverted and had to get over that. And I had to literally talk myself out of it. I literally remember, um, walking to places and meeting with people who I'm, I was very intimidated to meet and giving myself pep talks. You can do this. You're smart, you know, and just calming myself down. Breathing is a wonderful tool because when you're all amped up, you are at your worst. And when you can take a breath and when you can just collect yourself and be relaxed, you are your, your best version of yourself. So there are a lot of tools that you can use to, to move forward and not let this disease prevent you from living the life you want to leave, live. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I see that in you. I mean, you and I go back a long, long way. I think actually the first time I was ever introduced to you, you may not remember this, but Dr. Wallace, you were in for a checkup and I was there and he said, I want you to meet Lauren. And he opens the door and there you are in the, in the exam room. I, you know, if anybody knows Dr. Wallace, you know, that's not uh, unheard of. <laughs> um, and so that's how we began our relationship. But I, you have always been so inspirational to me. And I, you know, you, what I've learned from you is that you're a doer and that, and that's, I've really tried to take that on in my own career and my own health battles. And, and it's, you know, if you say, oh, you should meet so-and-so, you don't just say that you pick up the phone and you call them and you say, I want you to meet Adam. And I want, you know, you, you do that. So tell me, what is it? Because I know you mentor a lot of people in the younger generation that's coming up, both, you know, particularly in the film industry. But tell me what you'd say to a 22-year-old lupus patient who wants to get into producing. I'd say find something else. No, I would, <laughs> <laughs> I would say, you know, um, first and foremost, do not let lupus define you. Do not let your disease define you. Uh, Nora Ephron had a wonderful phrase, which was never be the victim, always be the heroine of your own life. And, and I have that cut out in my office. So, uh, it is too, e when one has disease and one gets it young, it is too easy to get attention that way. And I've always tried to check myself. And I would say that to any young producer with lupus, check yourself that you're not using it to get attention, that you're not using it in any way, just that it's there, you have it. Everybody's got something. Eventually you'll learn that everybody has something mm -hmm. and just move on. Um, you can't, it's harder when you're young to say, I'm not feeling well today. Uh, because you want to get out there and say you're strong and have people hire you. I understand that. I never told anybody I had a disease. And even when I had cancer the first time, I, I didn't tell anybody. I barely mm -hmm. told anybody. Um, but um, so that's that's what I would do in terms of the disease. Don't let it define you. Move forward. And if you can, take a nap or do breathe in, during the day. In terms of getting into the business, that's a whole different story. That's a whole yeah. other story. Yeah. 
No, that's, and that's, that is, that's a whole other podcast, I think. <laughs> yeah. That's um, I'm happy to do that too. So tell me, I, you know, you have a, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. You've been, you know, what's next for Lauren Schuler Donner? I'm taking steps away from the business. That's what's next. I've done a lot. Listen, I've worked literally since I was 15 years old. Um, I, I worked hard in my career. I, at a certain point thought, okay, well, I've done all these, you know, I challenged myself in, 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 um, doing action films and doing, I wanted to be able to produce every genre. Um, the only thing I haven't done is movie musicals, but what I did was after producing, you know, many movies, like, I don't know, many, 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 many movies, I decided I would produce television and, and I've produced television. I love television. I love it because it, 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 first of all, my God, look, at, I mean, we're in the golden age now, but also the nature of it is that you're prepping one director while another one is shooting. And so you, for a creative person, you're, you know, you're, you're with whoever creatively needs you the most. You're here and then you're there. It's, um, and then I thought, okay, well, I've always loved musicals, so I'm going to go into theater. And I've taken two of my movies and turned them into musicals. Um, and so that's been fun and a challenge. A challenge. Mm -hmm. it's, very, it's very different. It's more about raising money than it is creatively being at the heart of it. So I find myself less enthralled. Um, but... Um, Oh, and animation. I've never made an animated film. Although I do, did create, we did create a free, free Willy yeah. animated series. So I guess I have. Yes, uh, but have. I, you know, I'm at a point in my career where I, um, I just want more time. I, I, I want more time for myself. I was very driven as we've discussed. And I was right. just, you know, fortunately, my husband of almost 39 years, you know, ha um, influenced me not to make the business, my life. Mm -hmm. um, I stopped having business dinners. You know, I, I started living a fuller life, which is very important. First of all, it makes you, you can give more. If you know more about life, you can give more creatively to whatever project you're doing. But uh, so he helped me with that, but still you're wrapped up, you're wrapped up, your head is wrapped up in the business. Now I, I want to, time to see my family time yeah. to travel i have a beautiful home in the, off the coast of washington state um reading for for pleasure what a thrill you know i mean it's just you know it's it's i, I am it, i am i have colleagues who will work till they die and the, and mm -hmm. and i always thought i would I actually, I gave myself goals. I thought, well, when I'm 60, when I'm 50, I'll retire. And then when I, I thought, when I'm 60, I'll retire. Well, you know, you just retire when you feel like retiring. I now feel like, okay, I've done it. Uh, unless there's really something that knocks my socks off if I get an idea or something. Okay, I'll do that. But otherwise, I am content not to. That's the, my, so my next journey is just to take it easy. So... I, I don't, I want to make sure I address one thing. I, you are a mega philanthropist in the sense that you not only um, do you give treasure, but you give time. And uh, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why that's so important. I, you and, and Richard was a huge supporter of Lupus LA as well. And so many other, other charities that I know you focus on. So how does that, giving back part of your story um, manifest and, and, and how does it relate to your lupus? In general, I believe that if you make a nice living, it is your duty to give back. Um, and if you are a celebrity, which I'm not, but I, um, those celebrities, you, it is incumbent upon you to use your celebrity for good causes. Um, I have been fortunate and I have been successful and therefore, um, you know, I and my husband give back to those organizations that mean the most to us. You know, we love animals, so we give back to animals. Um, I, I am very involved in the Motion Picture Television Fund which gives back to the people who make movies. It makes, it helps them with everything from elder care to 
daycare for, for children and helps them with their insurance. It, it helped them during COVID and financially. It helps them in a myriad of ways. And I believe it is essential for all of us who have been successful in the business to give back and help those who helped us make those movies. In terms of Lupus LA, um, having suffered lupus and been involved with this organization for so long and seeing how it gives back. And it gives back in so many ways. But again, I, my favorite ways are that it, it focuses on research, which is important because we do not have a cure yet. We have ways to, um, uh, put it in remission and, and ways to control it. And it also helps, uh, um, helps less fortunate people afford the medical care that, that you and I have been, have benefited from. And, 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 and that's enormous. So it's easy. It is, yes, yes. I, I, uh, I have benefited from those doctors that I know. I want to help others benefit. Um, I just think it's incumbent on every, even if you have to give a dollar, you know, it's incumbent to give back and help others. And I know, you know, it's interesting because I, this, um, Lupus was a, a tricky, it's sometimes a tricky charity for people with lupus to support. I, you know, especially successful people, because again, you don't love to lead with your disease. But I think, and I found that, I mean, I, I sort of started working in lupus charity very early on. So I was sort of, you know, just propelled into it. But I, I know one of the challenges is finding people who have the, the because the tendency of lupus patients is to say, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good. You know, but I, it's so important for lupus patients to give back to lupus patients. And I think you set a great example for that. Yeah, it, um, is. it is. It's easier. You know, it's interesting because when I had cancer the first time, as I said, I, I kept it very much on the down low. Um, I, I had it again, unfortunately, 12 years later. At that point, um, I, I was public with it because I wanted to help others. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then initially with lupus, yes, I, I was, no, I mean, I was, you know, climbing up and making my career. And I, I certainly didn't want anybody to find any reason not to hire me or work with me. Mm -hmm. No, but well, I, you're incredibly inspirational to me and so many others. And thank you so much for spending this time and talking to us. And, um, thanks for joining the podcast. Thank you. You're very kind, Adam, and you're a star yourself. And I thank you for all that you do for Lupus LA. For all the people who are watching this podcast, Lupus LA would not exist and not have the power and the strength were it not for Adam. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you. You too. Bye-bye. On behalf of the entire team at Lupus LA, we thank you for joining the Your Story, Our Fight podcast. Please tune in, spread the word, and come back for more inspiring lupus stories. I'm your host, Adam Selkowitz, wishing you good health, and to always remember, your story is our fight.